This session is sponsored by Quixel, the makers of Megascans. Quixel is on a mission to scan the world, offering us an all-encompassing library that we've dreamed for so long. You've heard the story by Quixel founder Teddy Bergsman in session number three. If you didn't yet, you should. Visit the Megascans library by clicking on their link or banner in the show notes and explore their full environment packs and individual assets you can use on your next project. Hi everyone, and welcome to The Spectrum. I'm your host, Ronan Beckerman, and this is my weekly experiment exploring the creative minds of architecture visualization, finding out what makes us all tick and push our limits. This week, I'm joined by a previous guest of the show from session number two, Luis Inciarte. Back then, he was a partner at Hayes Davidson, but since then, he formed his own studio called Ars Visualis. In this session, we'll talk about his journey as a graphic designer from his home country, Venezuela, to London, and through the major stepping stone that is Hayes Davidson, all the way back to his initial passion, architecture, and how to create a killer image that tells a story. Here we go, everyone. Session number seven with Luis Inciarte. Let's roll. Hey, Luis, what's up? How's it going, man? Fine, thank you. It's been a long time um, since we wanted to do this one. Oh my God, yeah. It's been, what, nine months? Yeah, I think so, yeah. It's really good that we get this chance. So we, we did a, uh, a really short one during the State of Art Academy number six when you were in Highest Davidson. So I already got to know you a, a little bit, but for our listeners, let's uh, get started fresh. So... Please introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you, your background, and how you came to work in architecture visualization. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. So my name is Luis Inciarte, and um, let's see a little bit about my background. So I kind of fell into architectural visualization, um, kind of an accident, uh, which is always kind of interesting. I uh, originally studied graphic design and was more interested in art, fine art and illustration. So I, um, I initially wanted to be an artist, but uh, the viability of that in Venezuela is uh, very small. So the next sort of best thing was graphic design. And um, I also had a very short stint studying architecture. So I studied architecture for a year, um, but I was al always interested in um, art, drawing, I'm always kind of a very creative person. I used to stay up at, up at pretty much all night when I was young, uh, drawing cartoons, films, portraits, that sort of stuff. And then I think um, as I was studying graphic design, one of the, the kind of big things was I always felt limited just doing things by hand, uh, you know, traditional methods. Yeah. So um, uh, at one point I decided to kind of take the plunge and uh, buy a Wacom. And then, you know, started um, playing around with the uh, computer, um, just learning how to actually, you know, draw with the Wacom, um, try to get some of the things I had in my head I couldn't do by hand. And then that naturally took me into illustration. And then after I graduated, I started kind of doing a bit of advertising work uh, and I worked in an advertising agency for a little bit doing doing a bit of traditional graphic design let's say so I was doing um, logos and um, designing sort of brand identities for companies and uh, I started to dabble initially into like um, storyboards and that sort of stuff because I knew how to draw and some of the other members of the team didn't and then um, naturally that kind of hiked my interest even more into 3D. So uh, I, uh, at some point, you know, because of a friend of a friend or something, or you know, stuff like that, I got to know a local production company uh, who did a lot of short film work and um, commercial work and that sort of stuff. And they, you know, they had a really sort of interesting little process going on using 3D Max and uh, Maxwell Render, interestingly, at that time. Okay. And, um, I decided to give up what I was doing, join them for a bit. And then um, one of the founders of that company was also actually an architect. So I decided to, uh, to learn a bit more about Max. And then you know, we, we did a bit of character animation work, a bit of 
you know, the, the, the classic sort of things, a bit of modeling, a bit of character modeling, some horrible, <laughs> very early uh, motion capture animation work on like a few mascots and stuff for like football teams. Okay. So really, really, things are completely different from architecture. What, what um, year was that? Uh, this was 2006, I think. 2005, okay. maybe. Okay. So, um, it, uh, and at some point we started getting a bit of architecture work. And um, I remember I only actually only did one image with, uh, with this guy, um, helped him out. I did a bit of modeling and then um, we started using, I think it was, well, it was Maxwell for that specific project. It took a really long time to render. It looked amazing, though, compared to like um, Scanline and Mentory that you know, were available on um, Max out of the box. Okay. And then I kind of was inspired by that, and I started pursuing a bit more of that on my free time. Started looking at architectural pic pictures and reference and. You know, that kind of restarted my architectural um, aspirations, I guess. Because, um, well, like I said, I started architecture for a year, but it, it was definitely for me because um, I'm a slightly impatient person. And okay. <laughs> in architecture. So, so you, started, you started with architecture and then you shifted to, to the graphic design? Uh, kind of, yeah. It was, okay. it was pretty much hand in hand. But... You know, arch architecture was a funny thing for me because, you know, even though I love architecture and the history of it and all that's completely fascinating, but I'm more of a, like an investigator of architecture rather than an actual participant of architecture, let's say. Okay. So I don't really like spending loads of time designing architecture, I guess. Um, okay. But I do appreciate architecture for what it is and especially architectural photography and how you can inspire people and make people feel things about the architecture that would normally not be kind of, um, you know, if, if you do it in a certain way, you actually uh, attack the psychology of, of people. and You can make people feel a certain way, either through composition, lighting, materials, you know, that, that sort of good stuff. Okay, so, so that's the main driving factor for you being in the architecture visualization business? Yeah, I think so. It was a, it was a combination of uh, I saw an opportunity because uh, I didn't know architectural visualization per se existed until that point where I kind of did that first image. It was a really horrible exterior, actually. I can I can uh, supply that afterwards for uh, <laughs> okay. for the rest of the viewers. Yeah, people need to see where where, where we all start at, so they oh, have. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry, guys, <laughs> um, but. Um, Essentially, yeah, like the, 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 I, I, I'm also very geeky and I love uh, technology. So that was that went that was perfect. That went hand in hand. So it was a bit of architecture, my passion, and then learning technology. And then, you know, it was the, the art part of me as well. So it was like a really good um, combination of the three into one sort of aspect. Okay. So I remember that in our previous uh, interview, you mentioned that you were uh, in a lonely, lonely uh, scenario uh, back uh, home, right, in yes. Venezuela. And so uh, tell us about the transition you made. How, how, how did it come to be that you ended up in uh, UK, in London, at Hyas Davidson uh, after your uh, beginning in Venezuela? Right, so uh, I think like many people, um, probably many of your um, listeners as well, your audience, um, there, there's a few sort of distinct areas in the world where there is an actual industry or uh, like a thriving 3D industry. And um, coming up uh, to kind of my adulthood and that sort of stuff, I was always outside of the industry looking in. So I, I had like an idealized version of it. You know, big names like Adobe, Autodesk, that sort of stuff were always like mythical names that we all knew. And, you know, they, 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 I'm, sure, I'm sure they exist in, in, you know, in certain places and stuff. But where I was um, currently uh, working, it was, uh, I, I think at that time, there were around maybe 
10 architecture visualizers in Venezuela. Okay. And I'd say about half of them were in the capital and half of them were in the city where I come from. And at that stage, the internet wasn't as um, information rich as it is now. And um, bandwidth wasn't as easily accessible and stuff like YouTube, YouTube tutorials, all that stuff wasn't as easily found. Yeah. So you, you had to do a lot of digging, per se. I, I, I reckon maybe 99% of the people who use Macs now has, have never read the instruction manual. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so that, that was quite interesting, like um, doing the, the really basic tutorials, like um, the, you know, the story field one, a planet with noise displacement, like a really horrible little fat character. Um, but then, I don't know, but an opportunity presented itself where I was working in Venezuela and um, I already had my own company at that point and you know, a couple of employees working there um, where due to the political situation, um, it was no longer, let's say, a viable solution for me to kind of stay in Venezuela, per se. And um, I decided to kind of make the move to London because my wife has already already had family here so her older brothers and sisters and then um we just essentially decided just to move and uh, okay. start to start a new life so uh but then that once again but you know but growing up isolated and everything like um i remember it, back in the day cg talk for example there was a, a guy who uh who i used to follow his artwork very closely um and I can now call him my friend, Alex York. Okay. <laughs> bizarre, mate. It's really bizarre. Yeah. Um, that's a he, nice uh, That's a nice continuation to the one that was uh, uploaded just yesterday. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Definitely. Cool. Well, there you go. Yeah. So, Alex York, okay. Yeah, so uh, it was Alex York, and I saw a few of the images he, he had done, and I heard of, a, a, of this company, Hayes Davidson. Um, at that point, LinkedIn was really, really kind of young as well. So I went and kind of did a bit of research and then found out that he, you, he came from a company called Hayes Davidson, but he was no longer there. So I was like, wow. So this guy who was doing really awesome images and was featured on the front page and stuff, um, worked at this company. So I'm sure that's where he got his skills. So I started researching the company before I moved over. And, um, you know, at that point, everything was like, uh, you know, this is incredible. This is, you know, an international market. I'm never going to be good enough to kind of get on there. But, you know, let's, let's try and work on the portfolio. So after I moved over, I um, this is another interesting little factoid as well, which is very nerdy as well. I bought three, 3D World magazine. And um, at that time, I saw also an image from Ian Banks, who would recently left <laughs> Hayes Davidson. <laughs> <laughs> so that image was the brain, which is okay. one of the, the first images he uh, he made, and it also said he was ex Hayes Davidson. I was like, this is a bit weird. What's going on over there? I know exactly. So this company, what what is this company? So then I, um, as soon as I moved over and started working on my portfolio and stuff, I applied, and then um, thankfully got called over for an interview, and um, and after a month of like uh, you know me trying to do other interviews and stuff, I received a call back from them saying, oh yeah, cool, we uh, we want to get you in as a freelancer initially, uh, just uh, we need some help modeling some things for a really big project that we're working on. Are you interested? Um, before he finished saying interested, I already said yes. <laughs> so okay. that's um, okay. how I got my foot in the industry. And after a while, uh, freelancing there, I think it was like three months or something, they um, they offered me a permanent contract and then I decided to, to say yes and then, you know, make the most of it. Okay. And that was uh, back when, 2009, 8? When, when was that that you started? I started in, in, I think it was February 2011. Ah, 11. Okay. Yeah. So that was, um, that was essentially my first job in London. So I moved over um, and then applied to them and managed to, to, I don't know, smuggle myself in <laughs> as a freelancer. Okay, so tell us a little bit about the experience of working at Heinz Davidson. Heinz Davidson is probably the, 
the veteran of this industry with more than 25 years running, uh, probably Heinz Devins and D-Box are the ones that got this field started, yeah. uh, essentially. And you've been there for how long? So I was there for almost six years, so okay. barring a couple okay. of months, um, six years. Okay. But so what, what was it like? What was it like working at a studio like this? How, ma how many people were there at the time when you got started? Well, when I joined, uh, it was seven people, but it was after recession. Um, so the, the company was kind of, you know, the, essentially getting out of the, the rough period of recession. And you, you, uh, you might, well, you probably know, but a lot of companies actually went under during the recession. And Hayes okay. Davidson was one of the companies that survived, obviously because of you know, the experience and, and the reputation and everything, but because they're also very intelligent in how they, they run the company. So... Um, they were rebuilding a team at that point, and it had uh, a few, well, it was essentially partners that were still there, and then they were looking for new talent and uh, to rebuild the company, essentially from the ground up. I can say that I learned a lot of the skills I have now uh, there, like things like using architectural photography as a reference, starting there, the psychology of images, um, and I think it was a really good place for me to kind of get my background in art and design, uh, like all the principles, color theory, composition, all that stuff, and then really apply it and learn how to apply it and learn how to do things, why to do you know, specific things with beautiful architectural high-end projects. Which is, you know, it's that, that's that's I think that's the really really key thing in in, in our industry as well, because, um, you know, we, we always hear about these um, amazing schemes and buildings, and the architecture is usually fantastic, so it definitely is a lot easier to to get your message across or to create a stunning image when you have beautiful architecture to go with it. So I'll, I'll jump a little bit further uh, yeah. because now now you started your own practice. Yes. And to kind of tie your story, what was it that made you go on your own path after six years at Highest Davidson? What was the drive to do it? What, what were you missing that you're now trying to find out on your own? Well, before I came to London, I had my own company and I was running a, a successful studio in Venezuela. Um, then I, I basically realized that my skills weren't there yet in, in terms of an international market. So then Hayes Davidson was the kind of education I needed to get myself to that skill level. And then, you know, even, even though I was, I was super happy there, and it's, it's an incredible company, um, I always had that itch inside of the, uh, the, the being self-employed or, or owning your own company and trying that out again. Uh, that, that's something that I think that once you have it, it never quite goes away. Um, yeah, I can I can relate to that. Yeah. So um, I think uh, after uh, after you know the the amount of time I spent there and the amazing relationships and people I kind of knew, I I had to kind of try it out for myself again, and then you know use this the, the new sort of skills and and education I had there to try and, and build a much more complete vision of what I originally had all those years ago when I decided to, to own a company or to you know, make it uh, found a company. I see. Okay, so um, I'll rewind a little bit and you can, you can refer to this one based on your uh, experience in, uh, at Highest Davidson or your current practice, but y you've once said to me that you strongly believe, uh, you know, that the, the good old sentence that uh, an image is worth a thousand words and what, what's your main approach uh, when it comes to creating visuals for unbuilt buildings? Well, what is the, the essence of that process for you? Right, so I see myself as a bit of a, uh, let's say an investigator, a reporter. So you have somebody who comes to you with a requirement, a need, right? And yeah. they tell you what they think they need from their sort of perspective. But in order for you to actually build a complete picture and see what they actually need, you need to kind of um, question the process a bit. So they come with 
to you with a project. And then it, in order to build a, a, a complete brief, you need to you know, in, interrogate the process a bit. You need to ask the right questions. You need to um, look at all the material. And based off that, then you start to get you know, things like the target audience, um, who is who's the architect, um, the, the, is it is it commercial? Is it is it resi? Is it um, I don't know. Is, is it is it is it mixed uses? Is it a tower? Is it a house? So based off that, you start to build a bigger picture, and then um, always keeping I think your head in the back of your head, um, architectural photographers and photography, and then um, once you have a, a bigger picture, then things like style um, really start to to present themselves as a bit of a like a cloudy vision in the back of your mind. Um, one, one of the one of the big things I, I believe in is you should have no style. The actual architecture or project should tell you what style it needs to be for that moment in time that you kind of um, start working on it. Okay. So you 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 can start working on a pro, on a on a project at a very early stage when it's uh, let's say the general public hasn't seen it. So you need a much friendlier, um, softer sort of style, so it doesn't look finished. Um, so people can, when people start to see the project and get to know the project, they, they can feel like they, and they very much do, but they, they, they need to feel like they can question the project and participate. Yeah. Um, and, and also kind of, you know, uh, get their opinion heard about it instead of you seeing a really photorealistic image, final image, and they just go, oh, well, you know, the building's it looks finished. Yeah. yeah. And then, you yeah. know, you continue the whole process, the you know, planning process, uh, and then when you, when you get to the high end marketing stuff, then you can you can actually go let's say beyond photorealism. You can go to like hyper real, and and start making these beautiful sty stylized even um, compositions, very aspirational, very sort of um, you know to, to kind of awaken the the interior desires. You, you you put something in the image that makes you instantly identify yourself with. Um, you know these little hooks that that kind of get people interested, whether it be a person, a design piece, certain time of day, that that sort of stuff. Where do you find yourself more comfortable in that spectrum? Uh, the earlier design stages, visualization, the high end marketing, those hyper real ones that you mentioned. Where where do you find you you're more comfortable? Uh, what's your comfort zone? Um, I'd say I'm comfortable in any stage, really. It, it really depends on on the project, on what the project needs, or what the project wants at a certain stage. Let's say, like um, to me, it's it's the same. To me, it's it's a process and it's a means to an end. Like whatever tool you use to represent it, in the end, as long as you get the message across and you you kind of um, start to get people to feel when they see your images, then you you know you you've succeeded. It, you know, it, it could could be very sketchy and very like post production heavy at the at the beginning, or like very pure and very um, uncompromising sort of photorealistic three D. It really depends on the project. Like I I don't uh, to me they're all the same. Okay, what what are the three things that are most important to get the client on board in a way that flows smoothly with you and the process? Well, number one is listening. Listening to the client, um, okay. As people, you know, you, you 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 can listen, but you 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 can hear people, but you're not really listening. You know, and that happens quite a bit in the in the industry. I've known lo a lot of people you know, throughout my my time that don't really get to the point, even though that you know that the client is actually telling them exactly what they want. Um, I think the other one is. Well, me, me being very impatient and wanting to kind of you know, see results quickly, one of the other things is discipline. You need to be really disciplined and kind of, um, let's see, I'm not going to say force yourself, but really kind of be honest with yourself and say, this is the end result I want. So what do I have to do to get this end result? And then you, know, you kind of break down everything into smaller sort of tasks. Some people call it problems. Um, but you can break things down into small tasks and then feel like 
it's continuously moving. So listening, discipline, and then I think the last one is is always keep an eye out there for inspiration. So you you, you might find inspiration in, in any place, you know, while walking down the street, looking at the newspaper, watching a YouTube video, researching architectural photography. You know, always always stay hungry in that sense and like ingest as much as you can at this moment i'm asking the elevator pitch oh, <laughs> question yeah you, you have the advantage of already knowing about that one yeah. so who, who's your well i won't ask you who's your dream client uh, but let's say you're stuck in the elevator with a dream client okay you want to do work for that client yeah and he doesn't know you and you don't have vr goggles you don't have an ipad you don't have nothing you you just express what it is you want to express with your own words so what would you say uh to that dream client so that he uh starts a conversation with you about being you know actual client doing an actual project please work with me and run uh no, <laughs> <laughs> well they'd remember that for sure um, yeah I don't know, man. I, that's, that's... Let's steal some horses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They go, what? Yeah, here's my card. Run. Um, no, right. Let's uh, try. But let's see. What would I say? 30 seconds. If I knew it was an architect and they had a need for a project, well, I'd, I'd have a... Well, it's 30 seconds. You can't have a conversation. Would I have my phone on me? You probably will, yeah. But let's let's say the battery is dead. <laughs> oh man! Okay, human relations. I know. I'm I'm worse about this. Uh, <laughs> uh, it doesn't have to be thirty seconds. You know, I'm trying to get kind of like a distilled version of yeah. why and what it is you do. So you know, once we get enough of these, then we can maybe understand what it is we do so we can describe it better to others. Everyone, yeah. everyone is kind of like, you know, feeling a little bit uncomfortable when he tries to answer this one, but... Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, to be honest, I, I, think, I think the key thing when speaking to a client or a potential client is, like I said before, is, is listen. It's ask, ask the right questions. A conversation can be formed with just simple... Um, I think hooks in the in, in in the flow of the conversation. You, 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 how's it going? Blah blah blah. What what do you do? And then uh, he tells you a little bit about that. And then oh my god, he's he, he's an architect. And then you kind of say, ah, oh, cool. You know what are you working on? That kind of stuff. It, just just actually be interested in learning from another person. And then that naturally, like your genuine, I think, um, enthusiasm will come through. And I think that that's one one of the big things we 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 must continue to be in our industry is very enthusiastic about what we do because that excites other people and, and gets people interested, I guess. Yeah, for sure. So, what what, what do you do to, to keep yourself excited? And by the way, uh, I didn't ask this. Uh, the 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 new studio, Ars our, Visualis, right? I pronounced it correctly. Yes. Um, do you have employees already? How how many are you? So we're we're at the moment we're three core people, and then we we collaborate with other artists that I kind of know very well on on specific projects. Um, so uh, let's see. So I have it's myself as a creative director. So I oversee all the artwork stuff, and okay. we have a project manager who handles everything that uh, that is is incredibly key to um to the process uh, you know just to get everything flowing nicely get all the information that we need and okay. and you know keep the client sort of updated on scheduling and that, all that stuff and then uh a, a director of photography so somebody i've worked with for a very long time um who is an architectural photographer and also videographer and then we kind of complement each other as a sort of creative lead on the team and then for employees, actual employees, um, artists, we, we don't have any like fixed people. But we're, we're almost at that stage where we need to start getting at least one or two um, permanent artists. Okay. Okay, cool. So we can discuss this maybe a little bit uh, down the road in this interview. 
Sure. Um, but now let's uh, try to dive more into the actual workflow. So you don't have a permanent staff that, that's doing the work, but uh, what, what would you say uh, your workflow looks like from the moment a client comes in the door all the way through delivering the final product and what are or what is the most crucial aspect of that workflow uh, from your standpoint? So we all know the you know the general mm-hmm. workflow of how how we do architecture visualization, but you have a, you have somewhat of a unique uh, overview of this, and based on the core team, I I can already see that you have a lot of weight put on the uh, photography aspect and, and 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 the cinematic aspect maybe of mm-hmm of yeah. doing films for architecture visualization. So wh- wh- how's the workflow look like from your standpoint and what is the, the, the key aspect of it? So um, in terms of tools, um, like, like others have said before, like it's, it's very much the industry standard. Like um, we, I think me personally, I don't worry very much about tools and the current tools that we have available now, like Corona, Force Pack, Real Clone, have made life so much easier. Like we, we, we kind of step away from the technician role and we're allowed to be artists. Um, you know, that in, in itself frees your time to actually start thinking of, of images in a different way. So you're not limited by technology anymore in that sense. So I think uh, in terms of, a, let's say, a regular process, um, if it's a still image process, then initial conversation, we... We um, interview the client, as it were, um, try to get to know the client as well. So we win their trust and they kind of trust us as experts in the field. And we try to get asked the right questions to get all the information we also need from them. Um, that way, for example, that further down the line, um, when, you, when we actually win the project or have you know, make a bid and stuff, then we know what information is available from the rest of the teams. Because as you know, um, working on a project is the, the machine the machine is very big we're only yeah. a, a small part of the project so if, if for example if the exterior architecture is done then but 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 the uh, the interior designers haven't started working on on the actual interiors then obviously that limits what we can do on a project so we either either we uh, we decide at that stage to phase the project so we have different phases or we kind of say cool you know this is going to be the whole project but we're going to start this at, at this date okay it, instead of like doing different pitches for for each part not pitches but you know different um budgets and stuff for each one yeah proposals um then once we're, we're at that stage when we when we know more about the project we create a brief for it then comes a little bit of a brainstorming so the, the, the kind of first thing we ask of clients is if they have a model they do amazing, send it over. We evaluate what kind of model they have. We fly around the model and try to understand it. Um, ask them to send as much reference as they have, even their mood boards, inspiration, everything, just to try and understand from their side what the architecture is. Um, and then, as, as very much as architectural photographers, to try and understand how we can make this look the best. You know, what are the, 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 the amazing areas in the project? What are some of the key features? Does it have an amazing cladding? You know, is, does it look incredible, like as an elevation shot from, you know, one point perspective from the front? Uh, you know, any, any, any amazing features. And then that helps us go to the, uh, the, what we call the image planning process. So it's, it's when we, we just throw a camera in there, throw a light system in there, and start looking at what the architecture does. And you know what looks, I think, beautiful in terms of composition and space. You know, is it going to be um, a horizontal image? Is it going to be a vertical image? Is it going to be a square? You know, that the aspect ratios and composition. Okay. And then um, start. Uh, I think subdividing it by spaces. So if it's an exterior, then you know, is it courtyard, patio? Is it going to be the arrival scene? Is it going to be the hero, a general view? And then start doing research for every single one of these those parts and start getting references. So if it's, let's say it's a high-end, uh, very, very high-end um, 
power for marketing, then we actually start looking at beautiful architectural photographers. So one of the things I did was I built my own sort of internal database of industry leading, incredible, beautiful architectural photographers, not physically, but the work. This session is sponsored by Access Design, the makers of Anima, the all-in-one crowd management tool developed to make the process of adding 3D people to your still images and animations fast and easy. Find out more about Anima and their 3D people library by clicking on their link or banner in the show notes. Okay, so in the about text you send me uh, that's going to be live on your website, or maybe it's already live, you mentioned something about uh, the way you create images, and, and, and I'll ask you, what, what makes a killer image? What makes a killer image? Yeah, so that, what makes a killer image? That's what the clients are now calling. But, well, <laughs> we, we've always called them this, but now clients are starting to call them that way as well, the money shot. Okay. Right. So, um, yeah, yeah. essentially, we, you, know, you you can get a set of images, and they all help to tell the story of a particular scheme. But you also need, I think, as a, like this is my my personal opinion. But you need also to find a a the single image that kind of tells you everything you need to know about the project. It's okay. it, it's the one image that is going to because obviously, you know, we, we don't have a lot of time in these in this day and age, and there's a lot of distractions everywhere, and phones and tablets and flashing, you know, big screens and advertising and all that stuff. So if 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 you were in the let's say in the uh, I don't know browsing the web or or looking at a newspaper, and you only had four seconds, two seconds to look at an image, you need to kind of see something. If you see something that catches your attention, I, I call that uh, a money shot, a killer image. You know, there's something in that image that makes you take pause. Um, you know, some people say it's it makes you skip heartbeat. Some people say it kind of uh, you know it keeps make, you in the belly. Exactly. Yeah. It doesn't have to be the one that tells the entire story of the project. No. Right? It could be even a crop. Or exactly. Something really isolated. It doesn't have to tell or show the full building. Right. Exactly. Yeah, usually the ones that show the full building kind of turn people off a bit because we've seen so much of that already. Like, um, I, I think that the general sort of audience is, uh, we're kind of um, used to seeing that sort of image. It's, it's like going to the cinema and seeing like a massive uh, CGI fight in a film. It doesn't have the impact that it used to have. But then when you have something really subtle, really beautiful, might have you know a lot of CGI in it. Might be photography based, and then a little bit of CGI in the background, or the inverse. But it kind of helps you ground yourself and connect to an image. I call that the killer image. Okay. So pro- projects can have. Yeah, you know, there are a few projects that may, they might have five killer images, and you know, if, if you see each one, then you know exactly what the project is about. There's projects that might have only one. When you do projects, how many images do you usually provide? Are, are you going for, or are your projects are the ones that have many images in them, or you also do projects with, you know, just one, two, three, four, maybe, images? Well, I'd say so far, at least so far, um, it's about an average of between three to, to six images, let's say. Okay. And in uh, terms of film, animation? So... Based off those scenes, um, then we we actually, as others do, we fully model the scene, and then that gives us the freedom to actually just put a camera in there and see what we find interesting. So even even for example, even for a client, even if we're not doing an actual animation for a client, let's say, I always like to kind of you know take a day or something just to go in, maybe test out a few a few cameras a few camera moves just to see the space and that could go on the website as a, as an you know as a as a bit of an extra that we did for ourselves we could give it to the client it depends on the situation but 
I think we're 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 in the era of um, I think in in the past when marketing material was created for project or the marketing collateral was uh, clearly separate from the CGI aspect. So if 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 you were to get a a brochure, let's say, or yeah. a website um, in the past, you'd clearly see photography local photography, uh, then you get like those sort of really sexy vignettes. So a glass of wine, boca in the background, a person walking, a close-up, couple, all that stuff. Um, it, that could also translate into architecture. So you get like, a design chair, a designer chair, sorry, a, uh, a nice throw, some some materiality, like a, a nice sort of corner of a, of a you know, chamfered beautiful table, that sort of stuff. Now, we're at the stage where all of that stuff can actually be generated by our scenes. So we, you, you create one master asset and then you can do many things with it afterwards. And then that helps unify and keep a creative, uh, cohesive vision of the whole thing. Indeed. And um, once you have that, that file, uh, or maybe I'll ask this differently, for any given... Uh, shot that you provide the client, how many test shots would you normally do, or uh, you know, on an average, before you pick the the you know for a specific place or for a specific room, you need to give a one image for how many how many shots would you, on average, explore before you pick the one? Sure. So um, I, I'd say that very much depends on the stage of the process you're at. If if it's if it's early on in the process then obviously it would be less because you have less information. But if, if it's somewhere down the, like the near, nearing the, the marketing um, side of, of, of the process, then you, you, can, you can almost go crazy with it. Like, <laughs> you, yeah. you can have as many as you want. But then I think the, the key thing is, is filtering it down to the strongest ones and then presenting that. You, you, know, okay. you, you, you can do one sheet with various options and your suggested option along with, let's say, uh, like, a, like a, a reference. Or you can do, uh, as an aside to that, like a, like a poster of, of the best sort of vignettes and compositions that you found as well. So the client can kind of see this is, this is the, the, the image you want or the, 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 the classic sort of one image for a room. But this is what we also found in the same room that you can use as well. So lamps, beautiful, different, slightly more um, closer vignettes of, of the space as well. Okay. So you, and you provide it uh, as a kind of like a poster or one page that helps them stay focused instead of just dropping lots of images yeah. on them. For, okay, cool. How do you get that, and, and again, I'm kind of tying this into your uh, uh, about on, on the website in terms sure. of storytelling and effective architectural imagery creation. So how do you take both of these concepts, the storytelling and being effective at creating the archivist images in, into this process? What makes the final selection one that tells the story and effective at the same time? Well, I'd say that the first thing is, and this is something I heard and probably lots of people heard it, but um, it's, it's you, as an artist, you get all the bad stuff out or all the bad images out of your system Initially, you do all the bad images, and then slowly you start to get to the good images. By that, I mean when you start learning this trade, yeah. your initial images aren't going to be representative of the things you're doing five years down the line, right? Yeah. So essentially, what that means is the more images you do, the more experiences you have, the better you will be at judging what is a good image and what is an effective image. So that, that kind of ties together with, the, you know, with, with, I have over 10 years of experience in the industry and I've worked on a lot of different projects. So this is a very much a personal thing. Like I, I, can, I can see what a good image is and uh, 
usually those are accompanied by a small bit of storytelling. Storytelling, it doesn't have to be, there's a mother and a child in an image, there's a, you know, there, there's people in the image, a really kind of big, open, wide angle image. It could be very, very personal. It could be very, very uh, close and uh, zoomed into an image, but it's just little hints of, of things that you can relate to. It's, it's, it could be as far as the lighting, you know, the lighting is a certain way. Maybe somebody just got home from work and, you know, they left their bag near the door and their, their, you know, their coat or their jacket on top of a chair. And then, you know, they moved the chair. So you, you essentially leave those hints in the image and people can kind of see those hints and, you know, build up, up on them. Yeah, exactly. Build up on their own sort of story. So yeah, comp- uh, fill in uh, the gaps. Exactly. So that, that way people also get invested in the image and they do a bit of detective work. Okay. And when you take this into the context of building your team and, you know, growing the studio, bringing in employees, uh, what, what do you have in mind in terms of, you know, uh, making the learning curve shorter, you know, that knowledge you mentioned, any kind of ideas about how you grow a studio now that you uh, create your own, but after uh, you know a, a big experience at Heinz Davidson, then mm-hmm. you're probably already familiar or have aspirations, or you have some kind of uh, processes and, and uh, workflows in mind to put in place. I know that back there you had uh, this um, seminars concept yeah. that that you did uh, to kind of level up the the team from each one. Uh, so wh- what is it you have in mind for your own studio? I think that the, the, the big thing and the key thing, and this is something that is also something I want to kind of l- want to have in, in, in people who work with me in the studio is a, a continual thirst for, um, learning for knowledge and experimentation. You know, not experimentation in the sense that you're going to you know, open a file and not do anything for a whole day, but in the sense that you always want to keep learning. You, you know, you're interested in, in, I don't know, uh, like a, a making of article. Um, it, you, you can get references from, from other, other creators in the industry, like the, all, all, the, all the nice making of articles that you have on your website, for example. I always have a read, have a read of those. Because, you know, it might be somebody who's new and it's their first image or it's somebody who's very experienced, but you always have something to learn from somebody, from their process. Um, I think that plus um, always doing things, interesting things. By that, I mean um, traveling, going out on photo shoots with people, um, one of the one of the big things I do, and I've I've kind of neglected it a bit because I've been a bit busy with with the studio, and kind of setting that up. But it was um, just going out and having a walk and taking my phone and just taking pictures. In my case, it was about architecture and trying to do different things with with what I see. Um, if if you go to my Instagram page, you're going to see this. It's all black and white, for example. So that's the first kind of different thing. The second one okay. was, uh, you know, cool. I, I'm going to take pictures of black and white things, uh, things in black and white. But what makes an, uh, an effective black and white image? You know, it's, it's the first way we start taking pictures. And now with color, you know, you do all the really flashy and nice you know, images. But then if, if you go to black and white, you can distill it down to the most basic essence. So it's shapes, yeah. light, composition. You don't focus on anything else, and then obviously that's a continual exercise. So in in my day to day job or or artist day to day job, we you know because black and white is a very niche thing, and you know, we, we don't always get away with, uh, or very rarely actually get away with doing an image of black and white. You can exercise both. We actually use black and white as part of the process when we send images for composition selection where when we don't want the client to be yeah. focusing on anything other than Composition. the shot yeah other than the shot 
Yeah, that, that, that definitely gives it a... Uh, a I'm not going to say a, a, a more focused um, approach to the image because you're only seeing the, 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 the basics of it, right? You've seen composition yeah. shape, you know, the beautiful chair, it's, it's, in, it's on the lower third and, you know, you have something else, bigger in the foreground, stuff like that. But it, may, it forces you to kind of think differently. You don't yep. rely on, on color and, and a bright light or something like that. And so I, if I, if I, if I uh, go back to you mentioning that you're at the point where you really need to take on maybe one, two new uh, artists uh, to the team. So what, what is it you, you look for specifically uh, in those employees, which are going to be the first employees, right, in, in, in yeah. the studio? Yeah. So like, what are first, the three things? Permits. Yeah, the three things that are, you know, the prime uh, aspects of a new employee. Um, well, passion is a big one, obviously. It, it, and it, it's a very, it's a very obvious one to say, but you know, through through my my time at HD, I, I I interviewed a lot of people, and I was I was one of the people who who was tasked tasked with finding people. Okay. And um, you, you don't always kind of get the passion through when you when you or, you know a sense of the passion that people have when when you speak to them. So I think for that's, the first time. Yeah. Exactly. You know, you, uh, the way I see it is, I sit down with somebody, I have a chat with him, and I, I instantly go, "Yes, he's right. Why? You know, because I don't hear passion. He was knowledgeable about the things he wanted to say, and also because you know we can we can carry we can hold a conversation, and he's he's a very interesting person as well. He or she. Um, I think think that, that those are the the kind of key things because technical aspects we can all learn you know uh, that, that's 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 the easy part the hard part i think is is the the, the passion to carry yourself through deadlines because you know we have projects for example i'm working on a project now which was supposed to finish in april but at, at the at the kind of um at the kind of point where in, at the project it might finish up next year early okay. next year so you know, it, and it's it's a it's a completely normal part of the process because there's there's iteration and that sort of stuff. But that that you know, you need to have a certain sort of grit to yourself uh, to to self motivate yourself, I guess, to keep the passion going through a, through a, a long sort of process like that. And um, I think oh, obviously an interest in in art, and I think it's more about the personality of the people rather than the work. Uh, you know, obviously. I, I, I want the work to be the, the, the presentation card for the first thing I kind of see and then get to know the person. Yeah, because the, the, the visuals get them into the door and then they have to... Exactly. Yeah. That doesn't matter if someone comes with an architecture background or, or not. In your, in your case, I would probably say not because you were a graphic designer, but does it have yeah. any kind of weight? No, no I don't think so. We, no, like, right? it, it, it really depends on the person. Like you, you can come from any walk of life, but if, if, if like I said, if you're passionate and, and, and you have skills, then that's, that's what matters. Okay. So how, how many projects are you currently doing? So I'm currently doing three projects at the same time in the studio. And okay. there's one very small one, which is a um, small sort of house. Uh, that one, that one is a is a classic sort of quicker project to work on. There's this other project that we're doing in in, in America. Um, so it's a it's a high end luxury hotel and a, a tower, a residential tower. So that one um, was initially only supposed to be five images, but then now it's ballooned up to quite a bit more, and potentially a full film. With you know, filmed elements going on site, um, filming everything, doing the whole production, and then the post production work on top as well. So we're creating a full film in in under the one roof. Okay. And then uh, there's another sort of interesting project I I kind of dabble into sometimes, which is um, 
do a bit of consulting on the side. So it's a project in the sense that it's not directly related to production work per se, but I I do kind of do a bit of teaching on the side, let's say, to other studios. So I might okay. uh, visit, do a quick sort of Photoshop seminar or or a slightly longer session, two days a week, half days, that sort of stuff. Okay. And this is something you develop or think of uh, keep, in, keep on doing, growing it? Well, um, at the moment as it stands, um, there's the potential that that could be a, a, like a, a fourth pillar to, to the whole process. Because at the moment, you, you know, what I sent you was still moving for immersive VR. Um, but it, it's something I've been toying with. I, I get a lot of satisfaction off that because I get to teach people and see people improve and also build relationships with people. Um, and it's something I, I'm, I've, I've always had kind of in the back of my mind, like continuous uh, development. And that helps me as well because I kind of refine my process and the way I express myself and the way we can relate to each other, I guess. Yeah. So you mentioned immersive VR. So I, is this something you are implementing in production, you know, these days, or is it uh, in uh, R and D stages? Well, so at the moment, it's a bit in R and D stage. Um, we, we've done the investment, bought a couple of Oculus Rifts with the whole setup. Um, I'm sorry, people, it's not HTC Vive, but but it's the Oculus. Um, and using that same American project, we're because I, I I do have some some previous experience of working on VR stuff. But yeah, it's kind of seeing what we can offer in, in the realm. Obviously, stuff like um, still images, uh, stereoscopic ones, and then you know the ones that you kind of move throughout a space looking at hotspot dots and stuff, we, we, we're fully capable of that capability. But it's kind of seeing what's next in terms of VR. Obviously, I'm not kind of implying that we're going to crack the thing and, and yeah. find a solution for it, but... It, it's just understanding it a bit more because I know a lot of technical things of it, but it's just how it feels. What 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 can it say? You know, what's what's the story behind it? Why why do it? Yeah, how do you use the tool properly yeah. to convey the, the idea and you know in a way that the medium actually elevates? The best. Yeah, yeah, elevates the, the 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 message over just a simple still or a set of still images. Exactly. Yeah. Well, listen. This is sounds. This sounds very exciting, and obviously, I'd love to see uh, work from your studio when it's finished being posted on the showcase section on the blog and Definitely. being shared around. And maybe, maybe we can, uh, maybe I can take advantage of the teaching aspect that you you do, and maybe we can, you know, do some making ofs or showcases or case studies on on the blog as well, so people can. We can expose uh, some of the stuff you do for for people following the blog. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so I, I enjoy this this conversation uh, very much, and best of luck on uh, on your new venture. Um, and hopefully, we'll uh, be able to discuss uh, again uh, at a later stage when uh, your studio is much bigger. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, hopefully. Okay, so fingers yeah. crossed. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Liz. Thank you, Owen. that concludes this week's session big thanks to Luis for taking the time to do this recording and be sure you check the show notes at thespectrum.com to see more information how to reach out to him and you know just see the good stuff so send me any feedback you may have about the show so far and any future guests you'd like me to interview Have a great week. Be good. Do good. Ciao.